Okay, so I think I think we're up and running, but I can't tell. So if you see me right now, you think I'm a crazy person. I apologize. <laughs> so I'm trying to. Okay. I can see and hear you on the YouTube link. Awesome. Okay. Good. I'm looking to see if anybody else besides us is on here. If anybody's watching, just say hi to us. So I'm looking at the chat box on the right. Hmm. Okay. All right. Let's see. Well, I don't know what's happening here. I think we're good. Okay. All right. No, I feel like just the four of us are here. We're presenting to each other. Okay. All right. Um. Okay. Oh, now I see one says one person is watching. Okay. All right. Well, I'll just go ahead and get started with my stuff. And I think it records everything. And then, um, you know, they can watch it there. Trinity Walsh, um, College and Career Council at Highland High School. And um, I'm going to kind of be moderating this session. So um, if you have any questions, go ahead and put them in the group chat. Um, I think the first thing that I want to talk about is I'm going to talk about um, the uh, testing and uh, using technology for testing. So let me try to share my screen here. Oh my goodness gracious. Okay. And let me make sure everybody can see what I'm seeing here. Okay. That's not what I want. This is what I want. Okay. Do you see that on your? You see nothing. Okay. I don't think it's working. Okay. Let's try this again. Uh, Caitlin, can anybody see my screen? Kendall, can you see my screen? I can I can see it, but it's like I, like I can see bits and pieces if that makes any sense. So do you see? Okay, I can like see. Like I right there. You can see your presentation now. You can. Okay. Okay. So, um, a few years ago, um, you know, one of the things that we we do in a counseling office, which is not necessarily, you know, an ASCA thing, but it's, you know, testing shouldn't be part of the role as a professional school counselor. But, you know, most of the time we are involved in testing in some capacity, whether it's organizing the testing or whether it is, um, you know, just testing or whatever it is. Um, for me, as part of my job, I'm also our building assessment coordinator. So, um, you know, I deal a lot with testing, but the weird thing about it is that I actually enjoy organizing testing. So I'm probably like in the minority, but I'm constantly looking for ways to find um, ways to make things a little easier though in the role. So one of the biggest problems that we found that when we were doing it kind of testing, whether it was state testing, um, an ACD, AP, things like that, it is information is often difficult to disseminate to all the people involved. So, you know, your administrators, your teachers, your students. And so we were trying to find a way to make this a little bit more clean and efficient um, and come up with some kind of one-stop shop. And then at the same time, you've got to find a way to do stuff so that um, you don't create a testing violation. So that was, you know, another key factor in, in deciding how do we do this. So um, the elements, you know, of the test organization, this is your, your main element that you're going to need in, in anybody that's ever organized. Um, 
testing is to know that these are kind of your main elements here. The first thing that I've done, and, and maybe you do something um, even better. If you do something better than what I'm going to show you, please feel free to email me anytime and tell me what you're doing. Because um, I'm always looking to tweak the system and make it a little better. Um, but one of the, the, the first things that I always that we're doing is is this is this has become an evolution. So, um, so the first thing we did was the last few years we started the Google order, and um, and you know I just named something obvious for my teachers. So on demand 2019 is one from this year, um, and I just added the proctor manuals. So um, you know my. I don't know how it is with teachers, but sometimes when um, I hand them a, a manual um, a few days ahead of time so that they're reviewing or whatever, um, sometimes they can be misplaced. So um, by putting them in the folder, if they've misplaced their manual, I don't have to give the new one. There's another one right there online that they can print off themselves. Um, I have some that are very, very, very diligent about reading and reviewing it, and so they are appreciative of having it easy on the manual that they can go to to review what they need to be doing. So it's just um, so that everybody has the information. Um, you know, so I add it, you know, you know, in case you've forgotten it. Or another thing is reducing the amount of paper that's um, used. So this past year, the on demand for the 11 was 80 pages long. Um, so that's a set of amount of paper to be printing off for um, everybody who's administering the test. Um, so, you know, I printed them one copy. Um, I think in the future, I'm going to double check with KDE that it's permissible that they don't even have a print copy. That they can just use um, it from their computer. Um, I'm going to double check that because, again, it's all about making sure that we're not violating any testing um, Rules and then you know guaranteed stability for all that doctors and administrators. Um, <clears throat> now this part of creating um, my rosters, I do this in Excel and I don't actually do it in a Google Sheet. I know I can do it in a Google Sheet, um, but I do it because it's just easy. I've done it for so long that I can do it pretty quickly. Um, I, my goal is really to try to transition this over to a Google Sheet and stop using two different programs, but um, <clears throat> right now my initial roster is to create in Excel. So uh, we do a lot of our Trinity. testing at Carlos High School. Trinity, we're getting a we lot do. of feedback. Um, can you mute your YouTube link? Because when you have both mm -hmm. Macs at the same time, it uh, gives like a oh. Okay, so let's see. How do I do this? Oh gosh. Go to, go to YouTube and then just click the, the speaker and it'll mute it. Speaker. Oh Lord. You know, for a for a technology person, you'd think I should be able to figure this out a little bit easier. Um I don't No, you're good. Do you have the YouTube link pulled up? This oh this one maybe? This. Okay, now better? Yeah, I think it might be a little bit better. When you have Is that better now? Give some feedback. Okay. Okay, now are we better? Much. Okay, all right. Okay. This, sorry. Um, okay, so, um, so most of our testing we do, um, when I divide them into groups, I do it a lot of, a lot of it alphabetically. It's just easier for us that way. Um, and then pull out, um, and students get any kind of accommodations for those groups. But we're, we're, we run things pretty much alphabetically. Um, so for me, I'm exporting stuff from Infinite Campus with my ad hoc, uh, the things I'm pulling are this column right there, this last name, first name, grade, um, homeroom teacher, student number, and their act today. Um, is one of the things that I find in Infinite Kids is if you don't do that, um, you get a lot of kids that you know, may have withdrawn throughout the year and then 
you know, accidentally put them on the roster and the teacher's looking for them and you go, oh, they withdrew three months ago. So, um, you know, Active Today helps with that process as well, pulling out the kids that are not active. Um, and I typically will sort it. Um, I will add a column to the front end called type. And then I'll add like anybody that has any kind of special thing accommodations. So if they get extra time, any additional kinds of accommodations, I'm gonna put that into that column and then I'll resort them so that those kids can pull up at the top. Um, then I will add two more columns at the other end, rooms and markers. So what room are those kids gonna test in and what teacher is going to proctor that test. So that it at the end it's sort of look something like this. So you know, um, my kid at the top there, those are my alternative assessment kids. Um, then I've got an ELL student, and I've got extended time for one and a half, extended time, double time, reader, scribe. So I kind of do that so I can sort them all together. And then I've added in um, who's going to be testing the test rooms. Um, this is extremely helpful when I get to my next step, which is when I create my passes for my students. Again, I'm not, I have worked at a ton of schools in Kentucky, so I have seen a lot of different processes where or how other schools do it. This is what works for us pretty easily. Um, so I will then go, let me get back up. So from here on this screen, what I'll do is I'll add page breaks every single one you know, of those teachers so that once it prints a roster it's only printing students that are in each one of those classrooms and then i'll add some headers so that i end up with a finished roster that looks something like this um, these rosters are also very acceptable for kde because i put the information um, everything that they need on it so at the high school what the test was the date of it um, I always have teachers sign off at the top of it because I give them, I also have them mark on there just as a keeper of who was absent and things like that. Um, and then I use these for our own records. So I've got these rosters right here. So this is something, you know, kind of what it would look like. Um, and then as long as I have it all in that Excel spreadsheet, then I will make passes for our students and they get these passes the, the day or two before the test so that they know what where they are going for their testing. Because um, at the high school level, you know, you know, they have multiple periods in a day, so they can just stay in one room um, like they would for an elementary room. So this is going to tell them where they're going to be, and I found this to be really helpful because um, it's once I've got it set up, I can just use Elmer, put those passes to the kids, um, and that's the, the really important reason why when I pull the data at the, from the ad hoc, I choose their home room as one of the options because then I can sort them um, and deliver them to their home rooms um, as they are, so they can get their passes. So this will give them all their information. Um, and reasons some just quick and detail, you know, what time to be there, make sure the MacBook is charged, um, is, you know, okay, this year was online, so reminding them to do those things. So um, that's kind of how we get the kids where they need to be. Um, and then from there, then I go back into Google. So um, I'll transfer all of that information into um, a Google Sheet. And then once I've got that, then I add a new column on the end, which is an attendance column. Um, this was something new that we did um, this year, and it's one of those kind of uh, moments. Um, not really sure we never did this before. Um, but at our school, we have an attendance um, secretary. And so, especially when you're doing testing at the very beginning of the school day, um, you know, it's imperative to make sure you're taking attendance that everybody is there. And so, one of the things that um, we were doing was we'd have the paper rosters that I would have, and then I would send, you know, a teacher who was helping me um, or another counselor around to collect attendance from. 
um, each one of the test rooms. And um, this year, for some reason, I said, why are we doing this? And um, just add the attendance column. And when teachers, um, they get this link for this uh, Google Drive. They go in here, they mark attendance, mark who was absent, and then our attendance secretary has that link as well. And you can see who's missing for the day. So it, it's one of those things where it's so simple that we never remembered or thought of doing it. So um, when we did it this year, it was super helpful. So collecting attendance that way on testing days um, was very helpful. Um, you know, in the, the starting point to this was timing. That was really where we began. So probably about or six years ago, um, and, and I don't know how it is in your schools, but when you've got a lot of different testing rooms, while for the most part moving at the same pace, sometimes you know a teacher gets off, um, you know, depending on what's happening in the room. So it was really difficult walking around, checking to make sure everybody was kind of on pace and where everybody was. And it started with a, a timing spreadsheet. So you know, basically it started because I was too lazy to walk all over the building and keep checking on these people and finding where they were. So this whole process began with a Google Sheet where I would give the teachers a link and I would say, tell me what time you spend your test, tell me what time you're finishing your test, and then we kind of watch the progression um, as teachers move through their test, and we really didn't have to go anywhere. We could see when somebody got really far off and their timing was kind of messed up, we could go, things going on in that room, and we go and check it out. Um, also, it gave us the opportunity to give some quick notes. So, like, if you look at this spreadsheet right here, at the very top, you know, I gave them, even though I'd given them these directions, again, it was just some reminders, especially with the ACT. Make sure that you put the textbook on that the student use. Make sure, um, you know, they, they fill in the boxes for how many bills were left blank on the ECT. So it was, it was a really easy way to watch time progression. And that's kind of where this all started. So for probably for three years, this is what we used. We just had this one chart. And, and teachers really like it because they can kind of see where everybody else is in the mix and they can kind of gauge what am, am I really far off? Am I, you know, right on pace with everybody else? So that's kind of where it all started. Um, and then, you know, this was kind of a look at our K prep or on demand. So kind of where we're and with on demand because it is so long. Um, and it really only impacts, you know, one level and a lot of other things are happening in May. As everybody knows, a lot of times we have teams that are giving on demand. So, um, you know, so I set this one up as a team of people went in, put a start and stop times in, and so it kind of rearranged like that. So it's really just organization. This is nothing really, I mean, it helps the kids because we're organized and, you feel more confident about what's going on, but it's really to help the teachers and kind of help everybody else. Let's see. All right. So let me show you. Um, let's see. It won't mean. Okay. Let me show you what this kind of morphed into here. So the the other thing is is I use um, you know for our teachers what's happening with them and where they're being displaced. Um, again, we for the students that are not testing, we want to try to keep them you know in the classroom as much as possible, continue the learning. So you know people have to get displaced. And so one of the tabs here on my bottom was my teacher schedule and the display student. So, you know, for on demand this year, um, you know, 
Ms. Sager, her room is room 105. So we used her room for testing. So she was testing for three periods, but then she had to teach for a period. So I bumped her to room 106, which is actually Mrs. Claskin's room. They kind of flip flop. My teachers really like this because they can see very clearly what I'm doing every single period. Um, you know, and then at the bottom, I also list all my displaced students, you know, and who's going to cover those students because maybe they're kids that are in a primarily 11th grade class, but um, they're not in 11th grade for some reason. And so, you know, they're going to be displaced. So where are they going to go while the rest of the class is testing and their teacher is giving the test? So I got all that information there. So people who are covered know. Um, as well as recovering and, and where that goes. So it, it, it really is just a one-stop shop for everything. Um, again, here's that roster and attendance, and they can mark in there if your student is absent, and then the timing chart. So this is like our one-stop shop spreadsheet. So that's kind of what that looked like um, this past year. I'm not really sure. I'm sure it probably will grow as we go through the years, but, um, you know, right now, that's kind of what it looks like. Um, and then, um, let's see. All right. If anybody has any questions about that or if you have better ideas for me, um, uh, definitely all years. I know that I kind of went through that pretty quickly. Um, and it, it certainly takes a lot longer than what I explained to organize it all. But once we started using this method of organizing things a little bit easier, um, I think it was very helpful for um, all of our teachers, our administration. They see what the timing looked like for everything. Um, and they knew when we were going to be able to go to class and things like that. So it was really helpful. Um, okay, so the other thing is doing, now this is very student centered. So this is um, virtual reality college tours. Um, and so this year as the coaching career counselor, one of the things that I want to do with our students is find ways to um, allow them access to things that they possibly don't always have access to. Um, and engage them in some different ways. So one of them was this virtual reality college uh, tour. And um, toward the end of the year, I started these lunch and learns. So um, I plan to expand these next year with some different ideas. But um, you know, it's just a, an opportunity for students to learn a new college or career concept. And basically, I have them want to come to. Um, see what was going on, and um, and it, it's stuff that you know maybe we can't get into the classroom and and teach them about, but it's valuable information. Um, so um, this was a, a way to get to them. I'm really lucky that I have um, an entire classroom dedicated to the College and Career Center. So it's my space, so I can use that space to um, kind of do what I need to do. But this very easily, you would be able to do this in a library or uh, maybe teacher space that's you know in plan period during your lunch period or something like that. So I think even if you don't have your own dedicated space, you could probably do something like this. Um, why do we? Why did I choose the VR college tours? And, and it's really because we had access to VR devices. Um, I wanted to give access to students to preview a school before they made a real visit, um, so they kind of had an idea of what they wanted to look for once they got there. Um, even how students visit schools that might be too far away from them, and it really was a low stakes kind of fun thing for them to. Do. So I thought it was pretty easy for them to come in and they didn't feel any pressure. Um, so our librarian, media, media specialist, Mr. J, um, he put for a grant to um, purchase the VR devices. And so he and I collaborated on this part because um, he was looking for ways to use devices um, within our building well. So this gave us an opportunity to both uh, 
you know, kind of learn a little bit more with the students and um, teach them at the same time. So there's a kind of picture of our devices and lunch, but I, you know, I provide them pizza. This pizza is pretty easy and, you know, I can order it and it feeds a lot. So and then these are some pictures of the students um, using it. We did it two times um, in this, in the spring. Um, kids really seem to enjoy it. They really um, like being able to um, use the VR devices. Um, I think moving forward, if you see the pictures there of them on the VR devices, um, they're handheld units, but they also have plugins for audio, and a lot of the tours have audio that you can hear, and either there would be too many of the sounds going on at once. The kids couldn't hear it, or they would be quiet and they couldn't hear it. So I think what I'm planning on doing is I'm looking to purchasing um, either some reusable headphones that I can hook into that, or I even found some very cheap earbuds um, that if you come to lunch and learn, you get earbuds, you get to keep them. Uh, and I'm... And hoping that possibly that would be something that we either can purchase or I can uh, put it for a grant for um, with our foundation to fund um, those earbuds. But because I found what the person when I did, if I connected earbuds into the VR device and listened, it was a little bit more impactful. Um, and it felt very much like I was on college campus uh, versus looking at it, hearing the person next to me talk. So. That I think that's moving forward. What I'm going to do. Um, we use the Google Expeditions. Um, that's the VR devices we have, and then we use the online site um, evisit.com because they have um, a lot of already pre-built uh, virtual reality college tours. They don't have every school. Um, their catalog is growing, but there there is a good number, and in the state of Kentucky. Um, it, most of the schools are there. Big schools are there. Um, you can do about um, they're they're there. So our kids were happy to see that. Um, you know, if you don't have these devices, still not a problem. Lots of really affordable cardboard gear items out there. Um, and you know, so if a student has their own device, you know, their own um, smartphone. If you purchase one of these cardboard uh, VR devices, you could use their own phone as long as you could get to the website, the, the you visit website. Um, so there are some other options. And then literally, you have no bit for them. Totally still not a problem because there's still a lot of websites out there that you can do virtual tours that, um, you know, it's on the computer. So e Tour is a great one. I really like that one. I point that out to kids a lot to do that. Um, and then the U Visit site itself, you can do that just on a computer as well. You don't need VR devices. You can look at it, um, you know, just from your computer. So VR is nice because I think it's uh, kind of fun to be within the campus, but you can still um, – Still do a college tour without it. Um, now, you can see this is kind of how it went number. So the first one we did, we focused on Kentucky and Ohio colleges. We had 11 students come in. And then the second one, some of the kids during the first one, one look at the Ivy Leagues, most I think because they're just intrigued by it, plus a lot of them are too far away for them to do a normal college visit. So they kind of asked for that. So that's why I gave them Ivy Leagues um, during the second one. We had nine kids come in. Again, it was the first year. We never did lunch and learns before. I think some of the kids were kind of trying to figure out what that even meant. So um, next year, definitely going to be publicizing it a lot more, trying to get kids interested in coming. Um, and we'll do some other topics as well besides the college, the virtual reality college tours. Um, so kind of what's next for me is, you know, increase the attendance for these um, tours. Uh, you know, and I'd, 
I'm also interested in talking to some of my college reps and integrating with them. So, um, you know, I have a really good working relationship with our college reps. Um, and so, you know, I'm hoping that be my UK person when they come in, I can have a device set up with UK. And after they've kind of given their shield about what's happening at UK, letting the kids do kind of a VR tour and ask him questions about different places on the campus as they see it. So um, he doesn't know that yet, but I'm going to be asking him to do that. So, but I'm sure um, my guy Clay is, is going to be great. And, and so that's something to, to do because I like to bring everybody in together. And then, um, and then I'm not 100% sure how to do this, but I know we have people in our building who have worked on some of this stuff with our students and this, um, you know, possibly having our students create some VR tours as they go on college visits, um, create tours and uh, different, th different campuses and, um, and let us know what they think about things. Um, so, you know, we're so close to NKU that I'm really hoping that maybe they will partner with me at least for our first one and kind of go from there and, and see what that looks like. So that's something that I'm hoping to do in the future as well. Um, you know, and so that's kind of where we, where we went with that. So if you have any questions about college and career virtual tour, I'm happy to answer them. Feel free to email me, um, tweet at me, whatever uh, works for you is, is fine. And then, oh, it's 34. I did pretty good. I had one minute left. So, okay, and I'll see. I don't know. Let's see. Who is up next? I think, I think Damien is up next. If I'm correct. Nice. Let me open this back up here. Oh my goodness gracious, stop sharing my screen. Okay. All right. So it's back to me. Okay. All right. I think Damien is next and he's going to talk about the ILP. All right. Hello. Hello. How are you? Good. How are you doing? Good job. Thanks, Dan. All right. I think you're good. I don't know how to turn me off. Uh. All right. Let me know if you guys can see. Um, I'm going to share my screen. And then just let me know if you can see, I'm gonna offer a Nearpod um, code. So feel free to jump in and let me know if you are able to see that. If not, let me know that as well. But I do need you to, to use your audio to let me know. All right, <clears throat> can you guys see the Nearpod code? We can see the code. I'm just asking them if they, um, did you say that you have it in Google Slides as well? You can do it in Google Slides also. Would you prefer that? I just asked that in the chat box. Yeah, they just said yes, they prefer. Google Slides? Yeah. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Let me know when you're ready to go. I think they're all good. All right. Awesome. Um, <clears throat> so my name is Damian Sweeney. I'm from the Kentucky Department of Education. I'm the program coordinator for comprehensive school counseling. So hopefully by now you've heard from me or seen me uh, present. Um, so a little bit of background. I was I started at Fairdale High School in Louisville, Kentucky as a special education teacher. And then I went to my alma mater, which was Mayo High School. And I taught English. 
Um, I got to Seneca High School and I was there for eight years as a school counselor. For three of those summers, I was at the Governor's School for the Arts. Um, I've been at KDE for about 10 months and I'm also an adjunct professor at uh, University of Cumberland. So I'm very familiar with presenting virtually um, for that reason. All right, so in the chat box, um, just real quick, uh, you know, it's really important to build community wherever wherever we are, um, even if we are just meeting virtually. So just let us know who you are, um, what school you work at, and the best thing about your school year. I'll give you a few seconds for that, and I'll check in on that. Okay, so again, you're just letting us know who you are, where you're working, best thing about your school year. Awesome. Ooh, congratulations, Rachel. Okay, cool, PBL. We've got some exciting stuff to tell you about PBL. And Nick, it pertains to middle school, so that's really exciting. Elementary, we're gonna talk about elementary today, so that's awesome. Okay, all right, so welcome. And thanks for joining us today. Um, so we're going to just do a few little activities in that chat box. So I'll kind of toggle back and forth. Um, but next, I would love to know, um, what was your process for making your career decision? OK, so just briefly tell us a little bit about, um, about what that process was for you, whether that was meeting with your school counselor, whether that was an awesome um, career advisor. You know, how did you, how did you get to where you are? I saw you, Carla. Okay, hi, Jenny. All right, and I'm sure that project was awesome with your seniors. Okay, so how did you get to your career path that you're on right now? Oh my gosh, 712 students only met her counselor once. Interesting. Okay. Well, hopefully with this new Senate Bill 1, that will change. Awesome. Actually, that's like the most ideal situation. All right, so let's take about 30 more seconds and then we'll move forward. Sweet. Nick, that's awesome. All right, hopefully we can all say, um, have, have our students say that one day. All right, cool, Clarissa. Yeah, Natalie, I, I agree with that. That's how I felt as well. All right, so we'll move, um, we'll move through. And um, for the sake of time, I won't ask you to answer these in the chat box unless you'd like to. Um, but I wondered if your decision changed over time. And then finally, I also wondered um, how you ultimately got to where you were and then whether you felt like, um, whether you wished that things were different and if you felt like you lucked into your career path. Um, for me, I got very, very lucky. Um, 
I had a professor at Transylvania that sat me down my senior year when I was very lost and very um, concerned about my future because I wanted to do a million things, but not, I didn't really have um, an appropriate direction. At one point, I wanted to be a lawyer. Um, then I wanted to be a professor. I wanted to be a businessman, a psychologist. But ultimately, my senior year of college, my professor sat me down and said that he had spoken to um, other professors in my major, and they all thought that I should get into education and really um, look at the way that things were being done and see what I could change, see what I could impact. Um, so that immediately sent me on my path to um, getting emergency certified, becoming a special education teacher, um, then going to my alma mater, being a high school English teacher, and then ultimately becoming a school counselor. Okay, so I got very, very lucky, um, and I owe a lot to that man, because if it wasn't for that conversation, who knows where I would be. All right, so about today. So we've got three different learning targets. I want you guys to have a better understanding of the ILP process and expectations in Kentucky. I want you to understand and recognize the flexibility with the ILP, and then I really want you to be inspired to create or value the ILP. Um, it is a new day. Uh, for the Kentucky ILP. In the past, um, I think these three letters have kind of been, um, you know, ha had a negative connotation um, and they were synonymous with career cruising, which isn't necessarily bad, but it, it certainly became a compliance piece for many of us. We were very, very focused on getting the little bar to 100% versus how we could ultimately impact our students. All right, so where are we heading? We are heading to a place where there's complete autonomy and flexibility. Um, we want our schools and our districts to really create and, and be innovative and think outside the box with the ILP. And we don't really want you to have this cookie cutter um, platform. It's not a one size fits all. We know that. Um, and you know, at KDE, we don't. We certainly don't want to tell you um, the best ways for you to reach your students. We believe that. Um, that by creating something, by innovating, by working with partners, uh, you're going to really create something that you take pride in, and it's going to help you and your students become empowered. All right, so when we talk about the ILP, what does a quality one look like? So I've done a, quite a bit of research on this topic, and I found a few different quotes that I really liked. Um, so the ILP should be a document consisting of a student's course taking, and post-secondary plans aligned to their career goals. Um, many of you should know by now that we have new graduation requirements out uh, that we just put out a few months ago. They just got approved in April. And many of the graduation requirements say things like um, third and fourth year aligned to the student's ILP. That's because we really want this ILP to be a process for kids uh, that really helps them think through uh, not only their future goals, their post-secondary goals, but also what are their goals um, when they get to high school. So we also want this to be um, aligned to the post-secondary plans, of course. Then we want it to be a documentation of the range of college and career readiness skills uh, that kids have developed. It's also a process that enhances a student's understanding. Okay, so we want them to really understand um, much more about who they are as human beings um, and where they're going. We want them to see relevance in school courses as well as out of school learning opportunities. So we want them to start thinking about how they can get involved in extracurricular act activities or volunteer activities um, that will help them ultimately grow. And then we want this to provide students access to career development opportunities. Um, that incorporates self-exploration, which is huge. I'll talk quite a bit about that today. Career exploration and then career planning and management activities. So I spoke a little bit earlier um, and it was <laughs> it was awesome when you guys spoke in the, in the chat box, when you guys were typing in the chat box, um, I heard somebody say that their favorite thing from this year was PBL. And then I also heard somebody say, I think Nick said he was a middle school counselor. Um, we're going to really focus on uh, middle school ILP this year at the department and focus on how we can get our middle schools connected with our high schools in terms of career and technical education. You know, it would be very, very easy to put everybody on that, um, that platform that we spoke about earlier, um, but instead we really want kids to start thinking about, you know, age-appropriate tasks 
that are going to be engaging to them. So at the middle school level, we're really thinking about project-based learning and how kids can partner with different people in their communities or different industries and create these projects and have these fairs that will have high school kids coming in to, to watch the fairs, watch them present, um, have their families come in uh, as they present and really show off what they've learned about post-secondary options that are really aligned to what they're thinking at that age. Okay, so middle school is going to be a really, really big focus for us. Um, we had the pleasure of talking to Fayette County a few weeks ago here at the department, and they're doing some really cool things um, with their middle school ILP as well. So be thinking about that and reach out if you want to have any questions on that. All right, when we talk about the ILP, um, really, we should be talking about uh, using a web-based career information system, um, develop staff PD opportunities that will get them on your bus. We're going to talk a lot about having getting people on your bus, um, providing evidence-based resources, and then this should not just be you as a school counselor. Right? So gone are the days where you're trying to develop everything, you're trying to develop the advisory periods, you're trying to develop the lessons and send them out to your whole school. Um, this should really be a team effort. You can lead this team, um, but you certainly shouldn't be the sole person on that team. All right. So when I think about school counselors, I think about you as leaders. Um, you are all leaders. Many of you are instructional leaders in your schools. You're doing the walkthroughs. Um, you're helping your teachers. You're facilitating conversations about uh, different students and how they can grow and reach their potential. You are a leader in that school. So as a leader in leading this effort, um, you need to really define your why. You know, you can, you can take part in this ILP process and really make it cool um, and, again, engaging for your, your staff and your kids. So to decide what your why is and then identify a PLC um, that's going to be able to help you move this work forward, make the process simple. Right? So when you're in staff PDs and you're leading those PDs with your team, you certainly want to make sure that, that everything that you're telling them that you want to do with this ILP feels and seems doable and feasible. You don't want it to, to feel overwhelming or just like another thing. Um, so you really want to make sure that, um, that everything is simple, but that you have a good team that's going to be able to drive that work and drive that momentum uh, throughout the entire school. So if you value the ILP, so will they. So will your school staff, and so will your students, all right? But what I've seen is when people are like, okay, well, we've got to do this. You know, the state says we've got to do this, or our district says we've got to do this, or the principal says we've got to do this. That's when kids are like, well, I'm just going to, you know, quickly answer questions and not really think twice about it. Um, but if you really truly value this and see this as something that can help you as a school counselor, um, then again, your, your staff and your students will value it as well. So empower folks, you know, empower folks, um, knowing that a culture that buys in uh, makes it really hard for fundamentalists to dissent. And what do I mean by fundamentalists? You have to know your folks. And many of us, you know, as school counselors, we're really, really um, perceptive about the people that we work with and, um, you know, who's on our bus and who uh, might not be. Okay. So really work to identify who your believers are, um, who your tweeners are, who your survivors are, and then who your fundamentalists are. We worked with, when I was a school counselor at Seneca, we worked with this consultant, um, Anthony Muhammad, who wrote this book. He actually uh, spoke about our school in this book as well. And he does, um, he defines these terms, and I'll show you his definition of them now. Okay, so a believer is going to believe that there's success for all students. Um, this is going to be us as school counselors. Um, very intrinsically motivated, flexible with students academically and behaviorally, or mission driven, um, and have a connection to with the school or the community. Willing to confront negative talk and attitudes towards children, but only under extreme circumstances. Um, very levels of pedagogical and professional skill. Um, <clears throat> Our tweeners are people that are really just looking for that 
comfort zone within the organization. Um, they're going to be loosely coupled with the school mission, enthusiastic about the idealistic nature of school. They stay out of school and district politics, follow instructions as given by administration, creating a wall of science, and consider good teachers. One extreme experience is um, a moment of truth can swing them to be a believer or a fundamentalist. You've also got survivors, and we know people that are just hanging on. These might be the folks that at Christmas time said, you know, there's only 87 more days of school until summer break. Um, you know, for survivors, there's that overwhelming nature of the job or life has called clinical, has caused clinical depression or burnout, which is actually now a clinical term. Um, no political or organizational aspirations. They create some contracts with students to broker a ceasefire agreement. Um, you know, we've all seen that. If you if you sit here quietly, then I'll let you do X, Y, and Z. Not, little to no professional practice is evident. All members of the organization agree that they do not belong in the profession and removal and treatment is the only possible remedy. Okay, and then our fundamentalists are just trying to maintain the status quo. Um, they may believe that um, not all children can learn, uh, believe that school reform is a waste of time, believe in autonomy and academic freedom, um, have varied levels of pedagogical skills. All right, so really knowing our folks, knowing who we can get on the bus is really, really important for this ILP process. Um, certainly work with your believers and your tweeners, um, and then know how, and then game plan on how to get these survivors and fundamentalists on your bus as well um, in terms of this individual learning plan. And then get your local community involved. You know, bring, bring in speakers. Um, there are so many cool things that you can do with with outside folks. We did something that we called report card conferencing, where a student would get their report card, we would bring in volunteers from the community, and those volunteers would come in, sit with the student individually, kind of talk with them through their academics, see where they needed help, see if they um, could do anything to help, um, see if they can offer any advice. That was a really meaningful experience to our students, because after all, they see us every single day. Um, so being able to get that community in, involved and engaged was really, really huge. And then also get, get your community involved by taking trips. We went to the Ford plant um, several times. We went to different community colleges and universities. Uh, because we wanted our students to have those unique experiences. So by getting our community involved and getting our kids involved with that community, it was really a win-win um, process for, for everybody. And then find data that's going to inform you. You know, I can really see looking for data with this individual learning plan process and trying to figure out what will ultimately help um, engage your students, what will ultimately help bring them back to school in terms of attendance, um, what's going to help them uh, fulfill their goals. You know, they're identifying goals beginning in the sixth grade. That's going to continue all the way up until they're seniors. So let's get data that's going to tell us where did you say you wanted to go, and then a year out, let's find data that says, okay, um, you did, you were able to fulfill that goal, or you know what, you weren't able to fulfill that goal, and let's start thinking about the way that we're advising so that we can uh, get improved results over time. Speaking of data, so KDE has um, a very, very simple data collection system for the ILP. Uh, I think that um, when I got here, I really wanted to make sure that, that I was here as a support and that anybody in need in terms of school counselors and really anybody in need in, in terms of school staff could reach out and I could offer them help. Um, I'm, I've never been about, I got you. Um, I've never really liked that style and it's just not who I am. So this data collection system is really, really simple um, for that reason. It's for the reason that I, it's because I want people to create and innovate versus worry about what KDE is gonna be looking for. Okay, so we do have a self-implementation rubric where you can kind of find the letter of the law and everything that you have to do based on that law. Um, but outside of that, it's really fair game to create. Um, because of that, we're only gonna ask your superintendents to say, um, they're gonna do a, a, a quick signature um, and they're gonna say, yes, our district is uh, implementing the ILP with fidelity. Okay, so that's one point. The second point will be 
what we call a digital readiness tool filled out by the district saying these are our this is the platform that we're using or the system that we're using these are the people that are doing it and this is how we're how we're implementing our ILP so that's number two and the third one is when I come to your school I might say hey can I see you know these four or five ILPs I, it's not because I want to get you. It's because I want to see the cool stuff that you're doing. I already saw somebody in the chat box talk a little bit about, hey, I've got some cool stuff going on where I am. If you want more information, you know, email me or reach out. I want to be able to share the, the awesome stuff that's happening throughout our state. Okay, so three pieces of data that we're going to collect annually. Um, very, very simple, and it's simple because, again, we want you to focus on um, really thinking outside the box and, and coming up with something that you know is going to engage your, cool, your kids and your staffs. All right, so aligning graduation requirements to the student's ILP. We've got a lot of cool stuff on our website now um, that's going to really help take you through um, the new graduation requirements, but much of it is about personalized learning. So you'll see that there's no longer going to be this English 1, 2, 3, and 4. It's going to be English 1 and 2, and then your third and fourth year of English, which are going to be personalized uh, and aligned with the ILP. Everything goes through that ILP. Same with, same with math, same with social studies and science. Okay, your electives or other credits should be aligned as well. Okay, much of this is because we really want kids to find school relevant. And if your passion is ag and you can find a dual credit class in ag um, that aligns with uh, English or math, then let's do that instead of just saying, hey, do what everybody else is doing. All right, so the ILP is not only about post-secondary. It's not only about, you know, are you going to go to college, are you gonna go straight to work, are you gonna to go to the military? It is quite a bit about the social and emotional learning um, for kids, okay? This is one of our huge pillars as school counselors and, uh, right now, right? We need to be focused on the social and emotional health of our students, okay? So I see this as a huge opportunity for you to do a million different things that are gonna improve student learning, improve their their well-being, um, it's going to improve many, many outcomes. Okay, so just as a quick review, SEL is the process which children and adults acquire and effectively apply the knowledge and skills necessary to manage emotions, set goals, and maintain relationships. It's a process to help increase students' emotional intelligence or capacity to recognize, understand, and manage emotions. And then we've got our hierarchy of needs, right? So this is going to help us really tend to these needs. We need to make sure that students are, are physiologically, physiologically well, right? Do they have the food that they need to eat? Um, do they get everything they need physiologically? Um, are they safe? You know, many of our students just simply don't feel safe on the weekends or when they go home. So how are we helping overcome some of those safety concerns? Belonging and love needs. You know, how are we making sure that, that kids do feel like they belong and do feel the love that they need uh, to keep going on with their lives, right? And to be able to flourish. Uh, Self-esteem and then the esteem of others is really important. These are things that we really need to make sure that we teach. It's not just about your own self-esteem, but how are you helping the self-esteem of your peer that you see as down or your peer that you see as sitting by themselves in the cafeteria? All right, and then finally, self-actualization. How do we help kids reach their final goals? Um, whether that's post-secondary goals, whether that's academic goals, whether that's extracurricular goals, um, social goals, et cetera. So CASEL is the huge player in um, social emotional learning. So look up CASEL.org, C-A-S-E-L.org. Um, these are the pillars of SEL, so we've got self-awareness, self-management, responsible decision-making, relationship skills, and social awareness. I'm gonna show you something here in just a second that shows you how we are really trying to work with multiple states and mul multiple stakeholders um, to identify different um, social emotional learning skills that should be learned at every single grade level, okay? And we're gonna show you how to, to weave this in to the individual learning plan. All right, 
Just real quick, it is very possible to weave SEL into every academic content in every single lesson. It can benefit all kids, and there is not just one way to do SEL. All right, many times when we're thinking about just you know, a new task or a new focus, uh, we get overwhelmed because we've got so many different hats to wear as school counselors. Don't think of SEL as that. SEL, social emotional learning, is something that all kids need. It's all, it honestly something that we all need, right? So think about this as a way to um, truly help the health of your school. I'm very, very concerned about uh, the amount of suicides in Kentucky. I believe that social emotional learning can really help that, all right? Not only can it help that, um, it's going to help your achievement gap. It's going to improve your attendance issues. It's going to um, help decrease violence. It's going to increase mental health in your schools. It's going to decrease dropout. And it's going to de decrease discipline issues. And then remember the, this, you know, from your trauma-informed practices training, remember that many of the negative behaviors that we see uh, are based on things that we can't see with kids. Right? So they're based on uh, different histories of trauma that different students have, have had to overcome. Right? So when we see these behaviors, many times we're, we're not sure how to proceed, how to act. I think this individual learning plan can get you in front of these behaviors, help you understand that student more, and ultimately help you self-regulate, help the student self-regulate, help that student co-regulate, or really help you and your staff better understand them. All right, um, to grow your program, make sure you identify research-based materials and supplements. Um, coordinate with teachers and staff on how to embed social emotional learning strategies, include time for application of skills and lessons. Um, differentiate, always differentiate with whatever you do. Um, that's why at the beginning I asked if you would prefer Nearpod or Google Slides. I want you. To, I want there always to be a choice as well. Uh, move beyond the limits of the classroom. So don't just think inside that classroom box. Um, really think about this outside of the box. Um, share your vision and impact, and then find ways to incorporate SEL in the ILP, ILP process consistently. All right. So thinking about linking SEL back to the ILP, there is a Google Classroom. Um, that you can go to. It's got many, many lessons on it. Um, these lessons certainly don't serve as anything, um, anybody saying that you have to do anything. These lessons are here to really inspire you. I want you to start thinking about the individual learning plan, again, as much more than that post-secondary only um, tool, right? I want you to start thinking about acceptance and how can we offer lessons about accepting others. Uh, that are different from us. I want you to start thinking about finances. I want you to um, watch different music videos and start thinking about the choices that you make, uh, the healthy choices that you make. You know, all of this is really, really important, um, again, to this process that we call the ILP, right? It's not just one thing anymore. It's much more and it can be used for many things that can ultimately help you um, better understand your students. All right, so if you want to help with the ILP, um, one thing that I always tell, um, tell folks is that this position is, it's a, it's a huge blessing and I, 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 I feel the responsibility of that blessing every single day um, because I know that ultimately if I work with the right partners, if I send the, the appropriate messages, I have the opportunity to impact thousands and thousands and thousands of kids. So if you're interested in doing that as well, let's rebrand. Help me rebrand the ILP. Send me lessons or themes that you'd like to see, um, and then we can collaborate, and we can get those on that Google Classroom exemplar for uh, the state to see. This is the checklist. We're gonna call it um, something different, but this is a checklist that we've been working on with Arizona. Um, and this one is for grades five to eight. So yes, we are looking at and incorporating this at the elementary level as well. And we'll have different, um, different tasks that we offer. This is just a guidance document. You don't have to do it, um, but just different uh, things that we can help you, uh, that can help you get started. Okay, so we'll offer that. Um, of course, it's in the planning stages, but something uh, to be thinking about. All right, so don't forget 
Um, the new ILP is an opportunity for you as a school counselor. It's really an opportunity for you to capture a lot of cool data that can ultimately help your practice. It's an opportunity for you to engage your staffs, um, work with a team, be a leader at your school, and then of course engage your students and really um, offer them a meaningful tool that's going to ultimately help them in their academic careers. All right, so again, the only rules of the game are this self-implementation rubric. This is our ILP webpage at KDE, so go here. Here's our self-implementation rubric. Um, here's a video that you can watch uh, to kind of give you some ideas. Here's our Google Classroom here. Um, so we've got just a lot of different things on that website that you'll want to check out. All right, in the chat box, let me know if you had any light bulb moments, if you have any questions, um, if you are inspired to create, if you're doing something awesome and you want to share that, feel free to throw that in the chat box as well. And I would love for you guys to, um, to go to this link later. Um, I'll offer you the link to this slide deck, um, but offer feedback from today. Let me know how I can be best serve you. Um, that's what I'm here to do. I've got a lot of different uh, foci at, at KDE. Um, the biggest one is school counseling. Um, just so you know, we've got school counseling standards that are coming out here over the summer. Um, our first set of standards will go to our graduate schools. Um, there, are, there are Kentucky school counseling uh, standards of preparation. Those are gonna be seen by EPSB. Um, they've got a new office title, but I can never remember, Office of Education Lic Licensure. It'll go in front of their board next week. Um, we've also got Kentucky School Counseling Standards of Practice that will be coming out. ASK is currently looking at those. Um, so there's really exciting stuff happening in our field. Um, I'm also in charge of dual credit at the department, AP, IB, and Cambridge. I'm in charge of minimum high school graduation requirements. Um, I'm in the Office of Career Technical Education and Student Transition. Of course, you know I'm in charge of the ILP and also early graduation. So please, please, please reach out if there's anything I can do for you. Um, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I look forward to chatting and working with you and partnering with you in the future. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Damien, for presenting for us. Um, so our next presenter is Erica Thomas, um, and she, like me, works at Highlands High School. So she is going to be presenting. So I'm going to switch over to Erica right now. Yep. All right, you're good to go. All right, can you guys hear me okay? talk. Can you guys hear me? We can hear you, but you sound a little far away. Good I can't hear you. No. Are you muted?
o'clock now. Let's see. Can you guys hear me at all? Okay, well, I think I can hear through your computer. Maybe I need to mute mine and do it through yours. Okay. Um, all right. see your computer. Will you close those doors so they don't get feedback? Can you guys hear me now? Do they say they can hear? Oh, I can hear you. Yes, we can. It's much better. Am I good? All right. So let's go ahead and get started then. I apologize about that. We're having a little bit of feedback and some some volume issues, so I appreciate your patience. Um, as I said before, uh, my name is Erica Thomas and I'm a school counselor at Highlands High School. And I just finished my 15th year of school counseling and it is something that I am extremely passionate about. For those of you who are not new to the field, we've endured a lot of changes as uh, school counselors over the last 15 years, um, kind of shaping our scope of practice from more of the guidance, traditional guidance model to school counselor and um, really along with that has been a lot of focus about data collection and as you know with the use of technology this has really enhanced the opportunities for us as counselors to use data for many many reasons and so today I'm going to take the focus of advocating for your program and using data to build positive relationships with your stakeholders and the first thing I you know um, always think about is I always kind of get this question like why why do we need school counselors um, you know traditionally the task of school counselors was more as I mentioned before guidance based very administrative tasks whereas now uh, present day focus is a lot more on the whole child um, and a lot more focus on mental health needs and uh, various other factors other than just academic and so what we find, though, is that uh, parents, administrators, teachers um, haven't kind of caught up to speed yet in what school counselors are and what we do. And so oftentimes I find the question, like, why do we need you? What, what purpose do you serve? And um, I think sometimes there's a misconception of what we as school counselors do. And so the question I always ask myself is, why leave this to chance? And one of the things that I think that we can do as school counselors is really advocate. And, you know, we do that on a daily basis. We do that most often with our students. Um, and we do a great job of advocating for those gap groups and policy changes. But oftentimes we kind of forget to advocate for ourselves. And I think that's where things get lost in the shuffle, where people don't always understand what our role is. And if you tuned in to Trinity's presentation earlier today, she talked a lot about um, you know, her building assessment coordinator responsibilities, which is much more of the traditional guidance counselor role. So um, it's hard to change those mindsets when we forget to advocate and inform others about what we do. And you heard me in my title talk about a comprehensive school counseling program. And really the key I want you to think about there is the intent. You know, what we do is very intentional. And I think that's where data and using technology plays a significant role because using data, very easy to access data, can really make a difference in how we share that information with our stakeholders about what we do and why counselors are important. 
So why advocacy matters? So I shared with you here a couple of recent publications. Um, and in these publications, uh, Arizona and Oregon, um, or I'm sorry, Washington, you're going to see here that our jobs um, nationally, internationally, are really under the microscope. That is, um, you know, districts are under um, scrutiny for um, financial restraints that one of the things that they're doing is they're cutting school counselors. You can see Mead School, D school District Board is, is cutting high school counselors. Uh, Arizona has a 905 to 1 uh, student to counselor ratio, which is um, just unheard of, especially since ASCA, the American School Counselor Association, recommends that there's a 250 uh, students to one counselor ratio. So as you can see, um, I really feel for those Arizona counselors who are struggling with such significant ratios where it makes it very difficult uh, for them to really do their tasks as a school counselor. Another reason why advocacy matters is on the flip side is advocacy can really change where we are going as school counselors. Um, so you can see in these examples that I've shared, again, in some recent publications, through advocacy, um, states like Arkansas and Virginia um, are really uh, finding that what we as school counselors are doing is important and they're seeing the value in safety and they're seeing the value of really addressing the whole child. And so when we don't advocate, like you see in some of those other, other states, uh, we need to have a voice. And when you have a voice, you can see results like this really make a difference. So thinking about Kentucky, um, I really want to focus on this for a minute because there has been some amazing things that are happening in the state of Kentucky for us as school counselors. And uh, for those of you who've been following some legislation, um, the Senate Bill 1 just passed. And what is so incredible about this is that, um, of course, this bill is really focused on things like safety and resiliency in children. Um, but they're really focusing on providing a school counselor in each school with the goal um, of following the ASCA ratio of 250 to one. Um, and the other key part of this too, if you look there at the bottom of that, is that a school counselor shall spend 60% or more of her time in direct services to students. And I'm gonna come back to this a little bit about how this has impacted us here at Highlands, uh, even though um, we are working towards those ratios of how we have used data um, really keeping those goals in mind. You're also going to see that Damian just mentioned in his presentation this morning, um, he serves as the program coordinator for comprehensive school counseling program at KDE. His predecessor was Robin McCoy, and they have been amazing, you guys, um, you know, in creating the importance of school counselors um, in our state. And so we are extremely fortunate in Kentucky that we have such great leadership and value uh, at the state level to really protect and ensure that we have the resources to meet the needs of our students. You also see that he mentioned that there is an advisory council. I've been very fortunate um, that I am a member of the Comprehensive School Counseling Advisory Committee that's been working with both Robin, Damian, and us also other fellow counselors in our state. And I don't think that everyone realizes that they are creating standards and a model of practice for us as school counselors in Kentucky. And this is huge because this ensures that we are moving forward in professional practice, but also doing amazing things for our students. So I kind of go back to, I know that sometimes as counselors, we do a better job of advocating for our students, but it really advocating for what we do is also an important part of the process. So if you're asking yourself, where do I start? You know, I don't know where to really begin with this. What are some things that I can do within my building to kind of start some advocacy and utilization of data? So the first is we've mentioned uh, before um, the American School Counseling Association. And for those of you who have the link to my presentation, uh, you'll see that all of the resources I have lifted, listed on the left-hand side are links. So you can click on those and directly go to ASCA's website to find those specific resources. But I think it's important as you're kind of learning about advocating for your role as a school counselor that you yourself have to be informed. Uh, incredible resources certainly are something that um, technology has made very accessible to us uh, through websites, 
uh, and places like ASCA. And one of the things that I pointed out uh, is a resource here about appropriate versus inappropriate activities. And if you take a moment to kind of reflect on the things that you're doing in daily practice, you're gonna see that there are still probably a lot of those traditional guidance uh, type activities in that inappropriate column there. Um, whereas you notice the focus on the appropriate uh, activities, you're going to see more that there is more the whole child focus, um, where we don't want to just look at data entry practices, but using that data to really analyze helping students and parents make decisions for what's uh, in a student's best interest. So I really encourage you, if you're not familiar with ASCA or the American School Counseling Association, I really encourage you to get on those website, check out some of these resources. Um, and see if those really help you with feeling more comfortable and advocating for the purpose of your role in your building. So one of the things that I also suggest that I think is really great that is gonna use some of those data resources I'm gonna talk about here in a couple minutes is creating an advisory council. So prior to coming to Highlands four years ago, um, I was in a previous district in a building where we were the third public school in the state of Kentucky to receive ASCA's RAMP certification. And a key part of that was uh, starting an advisory council. And it's actually pretty simple. If you think about it as counselors, we have a pretty good handle on the population we serve. We feel like we have um, a good idea of the differences that we are making. And certainly we are working tirelessly every day to meet the needs of our students. But what we sort of forget is outside of ourselves or maybe our administrator in our building, Others may not really know what type of impact we make. They know we're important, but when they hear numbers or they see uh, the fruits of the labor, it, it makes it much more of them wanting to um, have a hand in advising and advocating for your role. So advocacy can mean just really communicating to your stakeholders. And by having an advisory council, um, it really takes the burden off of you as the counselor to have to be the sole person um, to be advocating about all the great things you're doing. Um, and so what I have here is kind of a list of some suggestions of some stakeholders. So when I was at my previous school, we had a parent representative, we had a student at each grade level, we had two teachers, we had our building principal, we had a community partner, so we had a best partner uh, with a local business that had come in and served as our community member. Um, don't forget too, you know, if you have some great relationships, maybe you have a central office counterpart who oversees the counselors in your district, or maybe a board of education member who you'd like to invite. Don't forget about them because they play an important part in funding and advocating for things within your district. Uh, we also had a school resource officer and then also your family and youth uh, resource centers. There's a lot of things in overlap in our schools um, that working with those, those individuals, it's really important to bring them in so you really have a really truly collaborative effort. But every building is different. Uh, the high school I'm in right now, we do not have a youth resource um, center. So if you don't, that wouldn't be applicable to if I created an advisory council at Highlands High School. So take a moment to kind of think about your building and who your stakeholders are. Um, it's really important that you choose uh, the members of your council that really does truly represent uh, your building. So why an advisory council? Um, I mentioned this in my previous slide, you know, it reduces that burden of you having to do all of the advocating. And the other part is I think it helps you create more positive relationships with stakeholders. And that kind of go back to my first question of why do we have school counselors? Um, I think that it helps them to really see and support and find value in what you're doing. And then I also think too, just you know, word of mouth, I, I say the telephone game, when you're sharing uh, data and information with an advisory council, they are also sharing that with others in conversation and email or publication. Um, and it really helps get that information out about all the great things we're doing as school counselors. The other part too that I love about an advisory council is it's not very labor intensive. You just basically set up a meeting in the fall and you set up a meeting in the in the spring. Um, and it's it's really the meeting is about 45 minutes to maybe an hour, depending upon what kind of information you and your council would like to discuss. 
But this is a key part. If you do think that you know you are interested in learning more about RAMP certification through ASCA, you will need to be doing an advisory council. And so part of the advisory council is you set up an agenda about um, the goals and tasks that you as a counselor or your department is working towards that school year. So maybe you want to reduce um, you know, the number of tardies in your school by 50%. Whatever it may be, whatever data you're going to be collecting, you can start small with those goals and really just use that advisory council as a chance to share that data and share the ways that you're working towards those goals. But that is going to be a requirement for RAMP. So if that's something you're thinking about, certainly that's a great first step uh, to start sharing that data. Um, the other thing too is I help. I think that helping and having an advisory council helps us feel more co uh, comfortable with data. Um, I know that not everybody is always comfortable with it, but I'm hoping I'm going to share a tool with you today that will help you see how easy it really is to pull very everyday data that can really make a big difference. Um, this is also a key part of a comprehensive school counseling program. Collecting data and making data informed decisions um, really helps with credibility in our role and um, gives us concrete things to share with our stakeholders. So data and advocacy and action. So I'm going to share a specific example with you about Highlands here. So as I mentioned earlier, this is my fourth year at Highlands. And um, last two years ago, we had a new superintendent. And uh, when she came in, the first thing she did was she started asking questions about what we needed, if there was additional supports, additional personnel that we needed to really be more efficient. And through her first year of conversation, um, she really shared with us that she was very open to seeing the importance of adding a fourth counselor. So we went from three counselors uh, to four counselors. And the way that we were previously kind of divided as far as our responsibilities were, I was the freshman transitions counselor. And then Trinity, if you heard her earlier today, her and another counselor, Laura, they split um, 10th through 12th grade, they split that alphabetically. So when we added on a fourth counselor last year, it provided some really new opportunities for us to look at our data and um, you know, kind of evaluate where we saw our need in using that fourth person. And so we ended up um, utilizing the fourth counselor that we now are split alphabetically by three counselors, um, grades nine through 12. So Laura has the first part of the alphabet and who is our additional fourth counselor takes the middle part of the alphabet and I take the end part of the alphabet. So we all have grades nine through 12. Uh, our student ratios are anywhere from about 268 to 300. So we're very close to that ask a um, guideline of 250 to one. And then uh, Ms. Walsh, again, Trinity, if you heard her today, she has moved into our college and career counselor role. So this was new. We had never had a counselor before in that role. So we were very excited about some of the new things that we were going to be able to do. So if you caught her session earlier, she talked about using virtual reality for those lunch and learns. Again, those were things we just sort of never had the time or a person to do those things. So we were very, very excited about those new opportunities. So you're gonna see here in this picture, this is a picture of uh, an iPad actually, which is how we use to collect some data in our office. And uh, we can't take credit for this actually. Um, Trinity had gone to a conference and had seen a similar idea that was presented at a professional development opportunity. And she came back and shared it with us as a team. And we thought it was a really great first step uh, for using technology to collect some data for us. And so um, through our office iPad, we use um, a Google form to collect some data. And the great thing is, is that through using this tool, we have been able to inform our stakeholders about the positive impact this has made specifically on our direct time with students. So referencing back to that Senate Bill 1, where they're really suggesting that 60% of your time be used with uh, direct time to students, this has really helped give us a really good gauge, a temperature check on how we are spending our time. So what does this look like and what do you need? If you decide that this is something that you would like to use, we house this right inside the um, office suite door. So as soon as our students, our parents, our teachers, guests, uh, whether that's you know a college rep, 
anytime anyone comes into the office, our iPad is on a stand just like this and they use the Google form and they sign in. So this helps us track the number of students we're seeing per day, per week, per month, per year. Um, and this really helps us just, again, collect uh, who we're meeting with, how much time we're spending with students and teachers and parents. So what do you need? We had an office iPad, so uh, we just purchased a stand. I gave an example here on Amazon for about $75 to purchase the stand. And then all you need is really good working knowledge of Google Forms. So this is, um, okay. So let me show you my video. Um, oops, hold on here. I wonder if this is because I'm on your computer. Can you give my access since you got my computer? Sorry, Trinity and I had to train, switch computers here so that you guys could hear me today. So I've got a video about what this looks like so that I can kind of walk you through. So why she is giving me access to this video, are we able to do that? Okay. Perfect. So let me tell you before I click this what we're going to walk through. So on this video, um, it's going to ask for the person's uh, name, their last name, their first name, their grade level. It's going to indicate if they don't have a grade level, if they are a parent, a teacher, a college rep, who they are. And then it's going to ask the purpose of why they're in the office. So if they're here to see a counselor about a personal social issue, an academic issue, questions about a scholarship, um, attendance, whatever it might be. So let's go ahead and play this so you guys can see what this looks like. Okay, so the great thing about um, that video is you can see it takes you less than 10, 15 seconds for a student to just put their information in. What happens is, is then we can pull that data. You're gonna see here on the right hand side is that it basically collects it into um, a Google Sheets form, which is very similar to Excel. And these are some snapshots of some data from 2018 to the year 2016, 2017. And so the great thing is um, in real time, I have access to pull up on a daily basis. I can see how many students we've met with, what the reason is, what grade they're in, what counselor. And if you look at 16, 17 versus 2018, you can see we've tweaked things a little bit. Um, in 1617, we weren't indicating which counselor was seeing which kid. We were just mostly wanting to see the reason for the visit. But now I can see and collect data that um, how many students I personally am directly serving. So um, it has been really amazing to have just access on a daily basis, a weekly basis. However often I want to get in here, I can see how often I'm meeting uh, with our students and spending direct time. Um, the other part, too, is you can sort this data any way that you want. So if I just want to sort by counselor, if I want to sort by grade level, if I want to sort by reason, it's very, very easy. You just click on the data uh, tab there and click sort, and then you can choose whichever way. So it's really easy to manipulate the data into whatever purpose um, that you uh, need. So... Um, Back in January, we were asked to present to our Board of Education about how we as a department have effectively utilized a fourth counselor. And this is where that data I just showed you really came into play. So what you're seeing now, the next three slides are exactly taken from the presentation that we shared with our Board of Education. So what we were able to do is take that exact data that I just showed you 
broken down by grade. And we were able to show that from the 2016-17 school year to this current year, all the way up to, to January, how many direct student contacts we were able to make. And when you look at this, by going from three counselors to four counselors, we had a 200% increase in direct student contact. Now we knew as a department that we were serving more students because obviously we had another counselor, but I'm gonna be honest, when we first looked at the data and we ran this information, I think we were all surprised that it, it totally exceeded our expectation. We knew it was going to increase, but we had no idea it was going to increase so much. And I will tell you, it was amazing to be able to share real-time data uh, with our stakeholders, our Board of Ed, um, about how this impact uh, with an additional counselor has made in direct student contact. And you'll see there, we source it. It's the data collected using our office sign-in iPad. So this was like super cool. And again, we didn't really recreate anything. This isn't a time um, uh, laborious a, a thing. I mean, the kids sign in on the iPad, I go into my Google account, I can click in there and see the real time data, I just sort it, and I can come up and see this information. Super cool. So then, and this is the second uh, slide that we shared at our Board of Education member uh, meeting. So as I mentioned, Trinity was able to move into college and career centers. So this was a totally new opportunity for us. She was able to have a new space. Um, she was able to do more direct collaboration with our college reps, um, more direct uh, service time with students for college and career planning. Um, she did all kinds of amazing things. And these are some of the examples that she was able to share with our stakeholders. Again, these are examples of things that if you do create an advisory council, the slides that I'm showing you are great examples of how you can tier the data into a way that helps them see all the amazing things you're able to do as a school counselor or school counseling department. So one of the other things that we do uh, that we are very fortunate about at Highlands High School is we meet with every single incoming freshman student and their parent for about a 20 minute scheduling appointment. And we've always done this uh, since before I came to Highlands about four years ago, so that itself is not new. But what is new is the part of the comprehensive school counseling program is that things are intentional. So one of the things that we did that was very, very intentional is now that all of our incoming freshmen had an assigned uh, counselor, one of our three counselors, basically every kid has two because they also have the college and career counselor, everyone was able to meet directly with their students assigned counselor. So prior to this year, I mentioned I was just the only uh, ninth grade counselor. So I was very fortunate that Trinity and Laura would help me with those you know, 275 uh, appointments, because as you can imagine, that's very, very time um, intensive. So now with the additional of the fourth counselor, and not just one person in that role working with freshmen, those families were meeting face to face and those students were meeting face to face with their assigned counselor before they even came into the high school. So about January, February of their eighth grade year, they already knew who their counselor was. They already started having conversations, building a relationship it was definitely super intentional. The other part that we do during those um, appointments, besides talking about scheduling and courses that they wanna request for the next year, is we actually do a comprehensive and creative four-year plan. We use a tool called Naviance. Um, so for us, I know Damian talked about the ILP. Naviance is a tool that our district pays for that we use for college and career planning. But before our uh, incoming freshmen even step foot in the high school, they already have a Naviance account where we have created a four-year plan that can uh, be used um, you know, uh, to be a working document that students can get into Naviance. It's a web-based tool to get in there and update their plan as their needs change. So we were able to share with the board about how much more efficient we've been with four counselors, how we were able to provide more direct service time. But through our incoming scheduling appointments, we also use something called GenBook. And in GenBook, um, our parents and our students are able to leave us anecdotal data about the customer service that they received with the counselor. So I shared with you 
the actual data that we use on our office iPad, but we also have anecdotal data to where our parents and students can leave um, feedback about the service that they received in working with us. And so this is really cool. You're gonna see two samples here from GenBook. So out of 52 reviews this year, we got 4.9 out of five stars, which I think is pretty amazing. Um, but you're gonna see that we were able to share great feedback, attentive and thorough, took their time, made us feel like we were the priority, answered all our questions patiently, never made us feel hurried, um, had a wonderful appointment with our guidance counselor. She was so knowledgeable and helpful. She showed us the Navion system and worked on my son's four-year plan. It was amazing. So as you can see, these are the other data pieces that we were able to share with our board of ed. And I will tell you, prior to this meeting, I think everybody knew that there was gonna be a positive impact, but when we can share specific examples of feedback and data about our direct time, this really helped with our credibility about how we were using this resource. And I'll be honest with you, you know, as, as there's all these funding restraints in districts, you always worry about, could you lose a counselor? Could you lose a teacher? When you are able to quickly present data and advocate for your role as a school counselor, um, I will tell you, we all walked away from that meeting saying, we think that everyone has found value in what we're doing and we feel secure now that we have the board support, our superintendent support, um, and we have the community support. You know, we have a lot of community here that attends our board of education meetings and it was great. You could see a lot of head nods and a lot of smiles on how great it was. We always knew we were doing these things, but we never had an opportunity to necessarily share that in a public forum. So it was really cool to kind of be in that advocacy role, even though that's not necessarily something we were always comfortable with. So, you know, everything's a work in progress. So what are kind of our next steps at Highlands High School? Well, we certainly have loved the check-in iPad in our office. It has really helped us with data collection, but I do think that we will, uh, each year we always reflect and work as a team to talk about how we wanna expand it or how we wanna utilize it more effectively. And I for sure think that working as a team, we're gonna continue to expand and grow. And that's, that's the part I want you to take away today is start small. Um, you know, this isn't something that happens overnight. You're gonna see a progression over the last three years and how we have fine tuned that. But I think if you have simple things like an iPad laying around your office, and you know how to use Google Forms, this is an easy way you can just have kids get in a habit of tracking, hey, logging in, I'm here. Um, I also think too, we are looking to use the data since we had such great success of our Board of Ed meeting, looking to expand and create an advisory council. Um, and what is great about this is um, getting some of that parent feedback really helps us find those stakeholders that are representative of our uh, community here in Fort Thomas. And so we also are fortunate that we have a board of ed member who is a previous counselor within our district. So for us, when we're thinking about creating a representative group, um, we have some really great people that we can reach out to and incorporate as part of our advisory council. So I encourage you thinking about what are your next steps. Um, I think sometimes we get so bogged down with all these great programs to track our time, time tracker. Um, but this for us, we have found has been a really simple thing that doesn't cost us any additional time. It doesn't take time away from our daily tasks or time away from our students. So I'm hoping today has really inspired you to think about what you can take away. Um, as I mentioned, um, our, one of our counselors attended a professional development opportunity and came back with this idea. And I hope that maybe today this will inspire you to think about taking some ideas away and using those within your own building. Um, I've really enjoyed sharing this idea with you today. I hope that you have found that this is very helpful. Certainly would love to chat or talk with you if you have any questions. Um, I've listed my contact information here, email and phone. And I just really appreciate you tuning in today. And um, I've really enjoyed sharing this information with you.
Okay. Hey, that was a great job, Erica. Thanks for sharing. I love the idea about the, the iPad use to check students into the office. That's a great idea. Um, can everyone hear me? I know I'm trying to go back and forth between the two screens here. I'm attempting to share my screen right now, so please bear with me for just a minute. Okay. Okay. There we go. Goodness. Okay. So, all right. So that was Erica. So next, um, we're going to move to our last presentation of the um, morning for the counselor track, and that is with Kendallin. So I'm going to switch over to her, and uh, hopefully it all works well. Can you guys hear me? I was already talking away and I thought. Okay, I'm attempting to screen share, but I don't think it's working yet. Let me stop and then try again. Okay, I think everyone can see it. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started. So, okay. So my name is Kendallin Madden and I'm a school counselor in the Kenton County School District. And so um, just a little bit of background about me. Um, like I said, I'm a school counselor. I'm primarily assigned to grades seven and eight. I've been a school counselor for seven years, and um, I was also a school counselor in the Erlinger Ellesmere School District for two years. I absolutely loved it there, but I've been in Kenton County for five years, and I love it here as well. It's um, a lot of changes when you go from a really small district to a large district, but um, you know, the main thing is just being able to connect with and help students. Um, so my building specifically is a preschool through eighth grade building. And I have um, opportunity um, to work with students of all grade levels. But like I said, primarily, I am assigned to grades seven and eight. Also, um, um, can you guys view my whole screen or? Oh, I've just got it in the slides. Well, I'm going to click back and forth so it doesn't matter. So in December, I recently um, got my licensed professional counseling associate licensure and really excited about, about that. Um, my motivation for that was because I am working on my PhD in counselor education and supervision through the University of the Cumberland. And so um, I got my bachelor's from UK and then I went to NKU for, um, for grad school for my master's in school counseling. And, and like I said, now I'm at Cumberland. And um, so I'm also becoming very familiar with the, with the online virtual classroom. So we've talked about a lot of things today um, to do with technology, and I feel like a lot of it's overlapping. So I'm going to try not to, um, I guess, double dip. I don't want to go into things that have already been talked or talked about at pretty great length. But so specifically today, I'm going to talk about the ways that I'm trying to incorporate technology to facilitate college and career um, exploration. And that's going to go along with some of the stuff that Damien had talked about. Um, but let's first, let's talk about, talk about technology um, and why it's a good idea to incorporate it. Um, first of all, my school, like I said, I'm a preschool through eighth grade um, school. And specifically, our focus is on technology. We are a STEAM academy, so science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics. So just in grades six to eight, there are um, two teams per grade level. And we have worked really hard. Um, our principal has secured funds. We've written grants. But currently, one team um, per grade level, so essentially half of each grade level, um, now has a one-to-one -one ratio for student technology and it's um, we have iPads but 
um, that are also available to be checked out. But um, specifically within the middle school grade levels, students have Chromebooks. Um, and so we're working really hard to make it to make it to where within the next few years, all of our, our grades are one to one. Um, but right now, we have about half of half of each grade level. Um, so that's really one of the major um, motivations that I had to start using the technology because students were already familiar with it. At the beginning of the year, um, they get a lot of, you know, training and how to use their Chromebooks. Um, last year, they earned their digital license going through a series of lessons about how to, um, you know, how to use their technology, how to be safe, the restrictions. And so it really cut out a lot of front loading for me because the students were already using it in the classroom. A lot of the content teachers are setting up Google classrooms. So I thought, you know, for the past few years, I've been using technology, but I was always having to either write links on the board or, um, you know, send out links to students. And I thought there's got to be an easier way to have everything in one spot. So going back to why technology, um, is useful and why it's been important for me is most students have access to some type, type of technology, whether it's a smartphone, like I said, they have Chromebooks, most student most students have computers at home, tablets, and so it's just really accessible and they like to use their technology. And I know that even with us being a STEAM Academy, there's many times when students are restricted in using that technology. Um, you know, right now, they're mo other than their Chromebooks, they're um, permitted to use their personal electronic devices in um, during the lunch period or activity time, which is basically a time after lunch where it's like middle school recess. And so, um, so just being able to incorporate that really gets the students engaged. And so, you know, they really welcome the opportunity to use technology. Like I said, they're familiar with their Chromebooks. They've been trained in that. But even um, when students are allowed to use their personal technology, they seem to really engage with um, the content more. So just looking forward to what, you know, students are going to be experiencing, whether it's in high school, college, or even in their career, there's a big focus on technology. It seems like whether you are, um, you know, whether you are in the workforce or like I said, in college or some kind of, you know, trade school, apprenticeship, internship, um, high school, there's components of technology all around us, and we have to learn how to navigate that and become proficient on some level and with different um, tools. So, for example, you have Blackboard, and then you have um, Google with all the different um, tools that are in there, and then you have Microsoft Office with Excel and Word, and, you know, just making sure that our students are profi proficient in that because it's going to benefit them in the future. And so another, um, another positive Thing that I've seen with incorporating technology is students get to work at their own pace. A lot of times before I started using more technology, students weren't always able to fin finish um, what they were working on within that time period that I was there. And, uh, and I do go in, I forgot to mention, I do all of this through um, classroom guidance. And I don't know, one thing I'd like for you guys to put in the chat box when you get a minute, and I'm trying to go back and forth, but how many of you guys are able, first of all, are you elementary, middle, or high school, and are you able to go in and do classroom guidance? And even more specifically, if you are able to, how long, um, like how often do you get to go in and do that? Is it weekly? Is it bi-weekly, monthly? Um, yeah, just type that in the chat, chat box as I'm going along right now. So I'm fortunate enough that, um, so for seventh and eighth grade, there's two teams per grade level, so four teams total that I'm responsible for, and I'm fortunate enough to be able to see all those students once per month. I go into a different team every week, so one day a week I'm strictly in guidance, and um, I rotate through the contents, and that's at the request of the teacher. So one month I may be in the English language arts classes, another month I may be in the math classes, um, but usually um, I go into each content at least once and some of them twice over the course of the school year. So this is a time when I really am able to, um, to really address those social emotional learning. Uh, we do have initiatives that are school wide, but I'm able to really um, hone in on some of the specific skills in um, with the social emotional learning and then also college and career and then academics as well. So I'm trying to see. 
Okay, so Trinity gets to go in four times a year quarterly. Absolutely, share the wealth. I get that. And so, like I said, with using the technology, even once I leave the classroom, students are still able to access what they were working on and they don't have to rush through everything because we all know college and career exploration, there's so much students, and this is what I explain to students, you know, sometimes they do like the agenda that I have laid out and they're like, well, I'm done. And I'm like, no, you're really not. Like you, there's so much out there and so much for you to learn and to explore. You could, you know, you could surf it every day and not not even touch the tip of the iceberg. So students still have access to work on things outside of the classroom. Um, you know, it also using their technology and allowing them to use their own personal technology it adds a whole nother dynamic to um, the relationship that I have with students. Um, it kind of gives, gives me that cool factor. So, um, you know, they're able to use their own technology and they get really excited about that. And um, so that's just a whole nother layer. And then also some of the stuff that I use, such as like some of the things that have been talked about, like Google Forms, um, that helps me to track data and I can identify trends within, even within specific grade levels, because the trends within seventh and eighth grade are usually very different. So for seventh grade, I always focus, tend to focus a lot on social emotional learning because that's an area that the that grade level really struggles with. And I've seen that trend all seven years that I've been a seventh and eighth grade counselor. And so um, in using those trends, I'm able to identify students for individual um, counseling, for group counseling. It also um, really drives my classroom guidance and some of the activities that I do. We actually have, um, we actually have our sixth, seventh, and eighth grade tiered. Um, so we, just like ASCA lays out, we focus sixth grade on academics very heavily. And then seventh grade is that social emotional learning that we talked about. And then eighth grade, I have a really large um, college and career focus because I'm responsible for helping them transition to high school. And something we do in Kenton County is students select pathways um, going into their freshman year. So towards the end of their eighth grade year, you know, we meet with uh, the high school counselors. I feed into actually all three high schools in Kenton County. Um, but, you know, we have to figure out what pathway students are going to be best suited for. And so I kind of front load a lot of that planning um, over the course of eighth grade. Also, um, I do I collaborate with some outside um, organizations to help with my college and career uh, focus in eighth grade. Specifically, I take students on a junior achievement job shadow field trip every year. Uh, the students love it. It's one of their favorite field trips of the year. We also take them on a college visit to UK. And so just being able to help them become familiar um, with things before they get there. For example, you know, we talk about what's the difference between a bachelor's and an associate's degree? What's a major? What's a minor? How are, um, you know, how do credits work in college? You know, how much time are you actually spending in your classroom um, once you get to college? And so just things like that, so that when they get to their, you know, culminating event, I guess, as you would call it, they have an idea of what's going on and they understand some of the language that they hear. Um, also, I know Junior Achievement does a reality store as well. And um, that's something that I haven't taken advantage of. We did do it when I was in the Erlinger Ellesmere School District, but I know that this is something that they partner with to roll out for our ninth graders in the district. So I don't like to you know, don't want to step on anybody's toes. I know they do a really good job with that in ninth grade, so I'll just leave that to them. But for those of you who may be interested, you can contact Junior Achievement for the Reality Store or the Job Shadow Field Trip. They do a great job with that. And then also students can, um, like I said earlier, they can continue to access and, can, uh, and explore college and career um, areas on their own time at home with their family if they choose to. So I use a lot of different tools, digital tools in the past. And like I said, my goal for this year is just figuring out how to streamline everything and making it easier for me to access and easier for me to track date student data. So I've decided um, just with everything that the Google Drive offers, um, I've chosen to use Google Classroom this upcoming year. And so it's free, it's easy to access. You can either create an account on your own using a Gmail address or you um, your school district may be a subscriber. So you could also potentially use your um, work email address. 
And so there are tutorials you can go through if you're not familiar with the Google Drive. Um, it, you know, explains how to use it and the basics and um, just explains some of the tools that it offers. Um, in addition to Google tools, you can also other upload other documents such as PowerPoint, Word, and Excel, which I also do. Um, I find that very helpful. And then um, you can create folders to stay organized within the Google Drive because you start uploading stuff and then I have found myself to start losing stuff. So when I started creating folders, that was a way for me to stay more organized within the Google Drive. And your files are secure and you're in control of the privacy settings. This is something I really like. If I don't want a document shared and I just have it in there for my purposes, you know, I don't share it with anyone. But then I also have the option to give someone access so that they can view it. Maybe I don't want them to be able to edit it, but just view. Or if it's a working document and it's something I'm collaborating with, um, maybe the other two counselors that I work with, it's something that we can work on together. Okay, so I wanted to go ahead and get started. I don't know how I'm doing on time. Okay, so a lot of the information I wanna share with you, I've already uh, front loaded into the Google Classroom that I'm gonna be up, um, using this upcoming school year. And so I have that class code listed right here, um, if you can see it. And so you can go on in and join, it's really easy. I don't know. You just go to your Google Drive, sign in using your email, and then when you click the plus sign, you can either join or if you have the option, you can create a class. So what I've done is I've created a class, but if you guys want to log in, use that code by clicking the join class link. Okay, as you can see, these are actual assignments that I'm going to be using um, with my eighth graders this upcoming year. And I do intend on creating a Google Classroom for all of my grade levels specific to the content that I'm gonna be covering. So if you'll scroll down to the bottom, the first thing that I do, and this isn't really um, specifically to do with college and career, but I have found it extremely helpful is to, um, is the needs assessment. How many of you guys, if you could type in the chat box, how many of you have done needs assessments in the past? And if so, did you do paper-based or was it a web-based needs assessment? I'm just catching up on the chat here. I don't want to miss anything. So with the eighth grade needs assessment, and I've been doing needs assessments for the past, pretty much ever since I started, but I moved to the, to the web-based needs assessment three years ago, and it's been really, really helpful. So as you can see, it's a Google form. And so students, oh, sorry. Students enter their name, and I do have, uh, have it required for most questions. And so they enter their name, their homeroom teacher. Um, this helps me keep track of students only put their, you know, students have been known to only put their first name. And so then they select whether they're male or female. I do this because it helps me um, identify trends within the, the different genders. And then number four is please look at the following list of concerns and check where, you're, where you feel like your classmates need help with. And so when I'm doing this with students, I do go over it because I don't want them to get confused. Like this is not talking about issues that they may be dealing with. But this is what they see their classmates dealing with. And then I have um, number five focuses on their personal concerns. And so as you can see, it's a Lockhart scale type um, response. So strongly disagree, disagree, a neutral agree, and then strongly agree. And so it covers a lot of social emotional concerns, uh, mental health, um, dealing with uh, family, grief. And then I have also their personal needs specific to school. So organization, um, finding activities that interest them, setting academic goals. And then I also have an area where um, they can just tell me anything. And I always tell them it doesn't have to be something, you know, negative. If you, you know, tried out for a select soccer team and made it over the summer, like I want to know, I want to celebrate with you. 
And so I always have that as a required question as well. And then also I'll leave it open, number eight open for any concerns. And I tell them this can be specific to, you know, the counseling department, the school grade level, because I always let them know that this only goes to me. I don't share it with anyone, but if there is anything that is relative to admin or to their teachers, I do let them know, um, you know, whatever they want me to share in that, in number eight, in that last box. This document is really, really helpful, and I'm sure that a lot of you are familiar. You can, um, you have the option, which I don't have it logged in right now. This is a one for the upcoming school year. Um, I don't have one pulled up to show you that I've done in the past, but you can um, export data from these responses. And so, for example, down here on personal concerns, at the beginning of every year, I'll always meet with students that, um, that have checked that they struggle with something that's really concerning to me. So whether it be sad or depressed, um, self-harm, anger, thoughts, especially, you know, thoughts of suicide, always get to those students as quickly as possible um, just to make sure that everything's okay. And, you know, for some that may result in a phone call that, that we call home together and um, we end up setting up school-based therapy. Um, for some students, it, it may mean that they have the option to participate in one of the groups that I run. Um, sometimes I have to do suicide assessments based on the results of these needs assessments. But it, it really is very, very useful. And I don't think I realized how useful it was when I first started using it. But a couple years ago, um, actually pretty recently, it was just last year, we dealt with a student suicide. Um, and it was in eighth grade. And so, you know, whenever I was meeting with you know, central office and the admin team, and we were kind of, you know, looking at the data and like what we had, how we had supported this student, I was able to go back and show where this student had not shared any concerns. You know, he had rated himself, um, he had clicked disagree on most of these personal concerns, especially to do with feeling depressed or um, self-harm or suicide. And so I felt like that that was um, something that was really, really, really useful being able to go back and show through the data that I had um, when there was a really tragic situation. So that's one of the assignments I have laid out for next year for, for the students. And then also use Google Forms to do guidance pretests, which also gives me another data point to see if what I'm teaching the students throughout the year at the end, you know, they'll do a post test and then I compare. But, um, you know, I used to do this in Excel or I would do paper based um, pre test and post test and then I would have to, you know, calculate and transcribe everything myself. So once I got on board with Google and Google Forms, it's been much easier to keep track and being able to show that what I'm doing and what I'm teaching is effective. And then maybe if there's areas that, you know, aren't, I'm able to look at that and tweak what I'm doing. So that's a duplicate question, but I'm working on, like I said, updating this, but this is related to, like I said, there's a heavy focus in college and career in my, in eighth grade. And so most of my pre-tests and post-tests will focus on that. So this is going along with, um, with what Damien was talking about with the ILP. So as most of you guys know, Kentucky did not, or I guess it was KDE specifically, did not renew their license with career cruising a couple years ago. And so last year was the first year that we really didn't have access to anything. And so our district spent a lot of time, the whole school year, basically um, researching, you know, what would be an alternative to career cruising in the ILP. So we did, just like I know Highlands just said they used Naviance, we did have a presentation from that company. And then we also had a third one, and I can't even remember, it didn't have anywhere near the, um, the amount of benefits that I felt like Zello and Naviance had. Um, but Zello was also one that we, um, that we looked at. Both uh, Naviance and Zello had a lot to offer. They were very, very useful. Um, I think Naviance was a little bit more not much, but it was a little bit more cost efficient. But the defining, um, I guess, factor for Zillow for us was um, it actually, they Zillow has a 
contract, they have a partnership with Infinite Campus. And so it was very important for our high school counselors specifically because um, they use it more than we do, but they were able, Zillow and Infinite Campus are able to share data so they can export um, data from Zillow and import it into Infinite Campus and then vice versa. So that was something that they really, really valued. So we ended up going with Zillow and we all got our logins probably March and we started trying to, um, and I'm logged into Zillow right now. I, you guys won't have access, but I can show you what it looks like from a student view. And so, like I said, this is something that um, our district has aligned all the way from, you know, all of our middle schools and our high schools use Zillow. And that was a question we also asked is, could we use different, you know, different platforms? But our district wanted us to be aligned and I understand the benefit of that. And so we started playing around with Zillow and we rolled it out to students just so they could become familiar and figure out how to log in and create their passwords. So the thing that I really like about Zillow, I'm going to switch it to the student view now. Well, maybe I will. No, oh, it timed out. Sorry, you guys, it tummed out on me. Okay. So one of the things that I really like about Zillow, and, and just a side note, Zillow actually was created by Career Cruising. It's their new version. And um, it's very, very user-friendly. And so when they, you know, came and they presented it to us, there were a couple things that I really, really liked about Zillow. And number one, they students can create they can upload pictures, they can create a, I mean, essentially a profile, just like they have like on their social media accounts. And so, as you can see, they can pin things, they can do storyboards, they can do links from, if they have social media, they can link some of the things that are, you know, they feel like really represents them and that are important to them. So just in general, I thought the whole new look of um, Zillow was awesome, and it was something that students would engage more with. And so another thing that I really liked in career cruising, I felt like it was like you just had to really self-navigate it, and oftentimes that led to a lot of um, students weren't being very efficient in it, I guess you could say. But with, with Zillow, each grade level has um, lessons that are specific to their grade level that they have to complete. And so this is from an eighth grade view. So they go through their skills. So they do um, skills assessments, which I don't want to go through all this with you guys. It'll take forever. But students are able to go through their skills and do a skills assessment. They're able to do an interest inventory. And then just like they used to in, um, in career cruising, they got their, they received their matches, their career matches based on how they answered the questions. So I'm trying to scroll down so you all can see. I don't know if it's going to load, but oh yeah, here they are. So I took this from um, a student perspective. I was able to go through all of the matchmakers and the interest inventories. And so it gave me my matches, which school counselor was my top match. Isn't that surprising? Um, 
So, but you're able to go through and read about, just like in the old um, career cruising, they have job descriptions. You can look at um, the workplace, what, what the, like an average work day looks like, what kind of, um, what the task you would have as a school counselor, where you would be able to work. The, the earnings, and you can still switch it from state to state, um, the degree requirements, and then you can also, just like you did in the past, you can click on the different degrees, and it will show you the schools specific to the state that offer those degrees, and so it's, it's very much like career cruising, except I really love the fact that it has um, the lessons for each grade level that are specific to them. And so I think that was something at the end of the year when we rolled it out, the students were really, they were a lot more efficient and they were, you know, in the past they were constantly coming up and asking questions. And so not that they weren't still asking questions, but they were able to navigate it a lot more independently. And they can access it from home, just like um, career cruising. And so that's another assignment I have front loaded because we're gonna get in on that fully for this upcoming year. Then you can post just general questions and students can respond to them. So something that I have posted, you know, is looking forward, what are your plans for after you graduate high school? Is it college, a trade school, or entering the workforce? If you don't think that college is an option for you, please explain why. And so that will, you can post questions, students can, um, you can have students respond to each other or you can disable that. So that's some, another benefit of the Google Classroom. It makes it very interactive, which I love. And then something else that I do is some of you guys, I'm sure, have heard of Kahoot. And so just to make it more fun for students, instead of just doing like a paper base or, you know, a check for understanding, the students can you know, take the code and sign up and then we play the Kahoot, which I don't think we have time to do that. I was going to let you guys do that, but I'm sure most of you have used Kahoot, know how it works. I mean, it's, it's set up just like a game. The students put it in a code. They can use their personal, their personal phones or the Chromebooks and they top in the code. So there would be the game pin that you could top in, and then it would show me as the players. I'm sure you can hear that music. So it would show me as the students would log in, and they can pick their their own um, screen name. And then once we were ready and everyone was logged in, we would start the game, and the question would pop up on the screen, and then they would have 20 seconds to select an answer. And so at the end, um, you know, when the 20 seconds is up, it shows a percentage of how many students got the question correct and how many did not. So that's just a fun thing to do with students to make it more engaging and more fun. And all of the questions I have are college and career focused based on the things that we've covered. You can make just general announcements. So as I get closer to, to um, my junior achievement job shadow field trip, students um, are told up front that their placement for the for those for that field trip based on what companies are available um, will be based on the jobs that they save in their Zello student accounts. So, you know, as you go back to Zello, I don't know if you guys saw that there was a heart up here and you can save careers that interest you and then I'm able to export all of that data into an Excel spreadsheet so it will tell me you know that Sally's top careers that she saved are you know whatever however many you can save as many as you want but it all exports into an Excel spreadsheet so I can view easily and then I can filter that down to you know for example last year we went to St. Elizabeth and I was able to filter it down to um, students who save careers that were in the medical field. So that's another um, way that I feel like I've become more efficient. Something else that I do, um, actually, let me go back. 
I think I skipped one. I'm able to, and this was one of the things, because I already had PowerPoints created from before I started using Google. And so I'm able to upload PowerPoints. So I cover what, you know, the career clusters are. And then, uh, you know, just within career clusters, you know, what's a career pathway, how many clusters there are and what the, what the different cl clusters are and the jobs that are within those clusters. And so used to, I used to divide the students into groups and I would have, you know, markers and crayons and poster paper available and they had to create a poster based on the cluster that I assigned them. And then they had, you know, 30 minutes to create their poster and then they did class presentations. So moving forward, um, you know, using the, the Google Classroom, something that I'm going to have students do this upcoming year rather than creating the posters is they're going to have the opportunity to divide into groups and then create um, a Google slide presentation for the cluster that I have them assigned to. And I know that I observed them doing that in some of their content classes this year, and they're, they're really good. I mean, students are sometimes better than us as adults are at technology, so they were very creative. It was awesome, so I plan on doing that this upcoming year. I think this is what I was talking about with the clusters. Yeah, so I just uh, created an assignment, which I'm not sure. I can go through that if you guys need me to on how to, how to create assignments and how to post material in the Google Classroom. Um, but, you know, I put the parameters of their assignment, what they needed to include in their presentation. And then also something that I like to do at the end of the year, I do what's called a high school and beyond Jeopardy. And I give the students a word bank and we go through and it's it's interactive. I used a smart board. So I usually divide students into groups and um, I let them pick. And a lot of times they like to pick the boys versus girls and I either bring candy or um, I know sometimes I've done it in the algebra class and that teacher has agreed to give bonus points on their next exam um, for the winning team and so I just coordinate coordinate that with the teacher beforehand and let the students pick what they would want as a prize and then through the smart board I'm able to you know use my hand and click on these different categories so I'm not having and then I can click the home button you know, and I've got the little speaker that has the Jeopardy for the timer that has the Jeopardy um, song. And so students love it. They get super competitive. And then the questions pop up and the students have um, 20 seconds to answer before it goes to the other group. And they and they absolutely love this. This is one of their favorite activities as well. And then let's see here what else we have. Oh, something else that I wanted to bring up, um, you can see here I have Youth Science. So Youth Science is, it's not through my school district, but I do college and career coaching on the side for another company. And so this got rolled out to us last week. I haven't had a chance to play with it that much yet, but they did do a demo at the training I went to. And it is um, another version of, um, you know, a career exploration platform, just like Zello and Naviance but it does seem to be more cost efficient because I know that we paid thousands of dollars for our access to Zello and it's based on the number of students enrolled at our school. But we were told at the training for youth science that um, the most that a school would pay for this program would be $1,500. And that is re you know, regardless of how many students are enrolled. And something about the youth science they really um, focused on is it's it takes you through exercises but unlike it being like a questionnaire it's um set up like games and so students really just feel like they're they're just playing games but they're answering questions that you know give insight into you know their um the ways that they learn and what their interests are what their skills are but then something else it takes it a step further and this is something that zello and Naviance does not do and this was a major reason why um, the company that I do college and career coaching for chose U-Science is students are assessed um, and matched with careers based on their aptitudes. And so it's not just based on what they're interested in and what skills that they say they have. The, assessment, the assessments that they go through in the games actually assess um, 
you know, what they're capable of, and then that matches them with their careers. And so I thought that was very interesting. I plan on, um, you know, I'm logged in right now. I haven't done any of the exercises. We did the demo, but I really plan on looking at that a lot closer. Um, and it seemed to be very, very in-depth. And, and like I said, it seemed to be very cost efficient too compared to the other ones. So that's another option. I know when Damien was talking about, um, you know, the new requirements for the ILP, that they do want it to be a web-based platform. So that's another um, possible option that may be more cost efficient. Let's see. Sorry, I'm trying to make sure I cover everything. Um, and I know that a lot of people are still exploring what kind of web-based platform they want to use. And I know that we went most of the year last year without access to a web-based platform. So I have included some links um, to websites that I used. They, you know, they don't give you the reports and the data and their, um, but they do cover similar things to what the web-based career platforms do. It's just you know, independently operated websites, you just can't get the data from it. Like students are able to go through the questionnaires and then it gives them a result. But as far as you being able to view it as the school counselor and utilize the data, you're not able to. But Career One Stop is a great resource if you don't have access to a web-based um, web career platform currently. And so they have um, the matchmakers and the um, interest inventories as well. And then also, I don't have this uploaded into my Google Classroom yet, but I also cover um, Holland Code and talk about the career personality types and what, and what the different ones mean. And then I have students go through and take the Holland Code quiz and then it gives them their three letter code. And from there, they're able to look up jobs that align with their Holland code. So whether they are, um, you know, enterprising or artistic, just, you know, wherever, whichever area that is dominant, they are able to then research and see what careers would be a good fit for them based on their career personality traits. Okay, it looks like we are right on time. Does anybody have any questions? I haven't been able to look at the at the chat box. I didn't want to, I noticed that every time I do it, it shows my screen again. Yeah, I can give you the classroom code again. So I know I see that Tammy said the price. Do I know the price for this? Are you talking about for Zello or for the U Science? I feel like there's a little bit of a delay between the YouTube link and myself. If you're talking about the Zello, the price is, um, like I said, it depends on the enrollment. And we had to sign, I think, a three-year contract. And it ended up being, and Nick, I don't know if you remember what the price was, but I want to say it was close to like 7000 for those three years. And that was just specifically for my school. And that was with, um, you know, our central office covering the training, um, the training package that was rolled out as well.
trying to figure out how to stop screen share. Sorry, you guys, I'm trying to figure out how to stop sharing, but it's not really seeing that option. Okay. Does anybody have any questions? Turn it up a little bit. Okay. So I think that's the end of our um, counseling sessions, um, presentations. Um, thanks for joining us today. Um, I'm going to leave our contact information up here and what sessions we presented right there for a few minutes. So that way, if you need to get a hold of any of us or you need some codes, like I know that Damien had um, a Google Classroom and so did Kendallin, so some codes so you guys can get in and see those awesome tools. Uh, I'm actually, um, I've been thinking about those Google Classrooms um, throughout the course of the year. So um, I'm interested in trying to look at that for um, Highlands this year as well. Um, if you have any ideas or you want to present next year um, and you've watched this year, um, please reach out to us and we'd love to have you on board uh, of the team and we want to get this out to more and more counselors. So um, just talk it up and, and next year it'll be bigger and better. And if you have any questions, just let us know. Um, otherwise, I'm just going to leave this information up on the screen just for a couple more minutes and uh, reach out if you need anything. Thanks.